Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm Teresa Cardinal Brown, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this first live recording of this week, which we will also be releasing via video as we release our latest report, Turning Challenges into Opportunities, Perspectives on Immigration in Texas and Wisconsin during the 2020 election year. Last year, in collaboration with our partners in Wisconsin and Texas, we conducted a series of small virtual roundtables with community leaders from business, government, civil society, nonprofits, and more to discuss immigration, how immigrants are seen in their communities, how they feel about the national debate over immigration, and where they think immigration policy should go. The report that we will be releasing on our website along with this event contains our perspective and takeaways from those roundtables. Here are some of the key takeaways. First, these communities saw immigrants bringing benefits, but also challenges to their communities. They fill important roles in the workforce and bring diversity and dynamism, but they also sometimes create challenges of integration and providing services to them. And immigrants themselves can sometimes feel unwelcome. Second, the politics around immigration are overly divisive and reflects the polarization in our country. However, the shrillness of the national debate did not necessarily reflect the participants' own views, and they found fault with how both sides framed the issue. However, they also identified areas that they, they thought could be the basis of consensus, including focusing on the hard work of immigrants and the place they have in the economy. Third, the participants recognized the problems with the current immigration system that make it hard for immigrants and their sponsors to navigate and that lack legal avenues for many who would be able to work and live in the United States. They felt strongly that solutions were possible. Specifically, participants affirmed the need of the system to be updated and to allow people to come and work while also supporting families and protecting those in need. They also supported the involvement at the state or local level of governments where the needs are best known. Finally, there was broad support for providing undocumented people with a means to transition to legal status. As we enter a new era with a new administration and a new Congress, especially one that has committed to make immigration issues an early priority, and as we have already seen, it's worth revisiting these roundtables and the voices of these citizens of two key electoral states, from Wausau and Madison in Wisconsin and in Houston, Texas and its environs to see how the Biden administration might move forward with policies that can get broad public support. So joining me now to discuss this report and what it might mean for the future of immigration policies are our partners from these roundtables. Laura Goldberg, who's Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Communications at the Center for Houston Future, and Julie Bunzak, Program Manager for the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service. To provide some context as to how the views from these roundtable participants compare to the views of Americans across the country, we're happy to have Mark Hugo Lopez, Director of Global Migration and Demography Research at the Pew Research Center. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. So to get us started, um, let me start with our partners from Houston and Wisconsin. So um, Laura, I'm gonna start with you. Tell us a little bit about the Center for Houston's Future, why that center, why your center is interested in the issue of immigration and why you decided to work with us on these roundtables. Great, thank you for having me and good morning. So the Center for Houston's Future brings business, government and community stakeholders together to engage in fact-based strategic planning, collaboration, and action on issues of great importance to the success and future of the Houston area. So we have three kinds of areas, strategic initiatives, community engagement, and leadership. And our work often, but not always, has an economic viewpoint. Core strategic areas, given how important immigration is to the region's future economics, success. So specifically on immigration, we work to guide business and community leaders to develop a greater understanding of just how important immigration is to the region's economy. And then we work toward building consensus, consensus around solutions and spring action on solution. So we really enjoyed um, our previous work. We see, we, you know, we've We've uh, across you guys on events 
and um, in our collaboration with the Rational mi Middle Media. So in this case, we decided to purchase because it gave us an opportunity to give additional voice to people we've previously worked with. We felt it was a really great opportunity for those leaders to share attitudes and opinions in an intentionally bipartisan event. We also felt a trust in Teresa um, and your team's ability to encourage this kind of discussion. And we're always looking for ways to work with partners towards solutions around immigration issues. And we always look for new opportunities to, to learn ourselves. Thanks, Laura. Um, we really did appreciate the partnership we had with you. Uh, Julie, let me turn to you, kind of same question. Why is WIPS interested in this immigration issue and why did you all decide to partner with us on these roundtables? Well, we are a unit of, <clears throat> excuse me, the University of Wisconsin system. And our mission is to engage, educate, and energize communities around Wisconsin around issues that are important to them. We do have a statewide mandate, but we are located uh, in central Wisconsin, so about 175 miles northwest of Milwaukee. And a lot of our programming is centered around the central part of the state. And about three years ago, as we were kind of informally taking the pulse of uh, people around here um, to find out what hot topics or what topics they were interested in, immigration kept coming up from many different sectors. So we decided that we would put together a three-part series on the topic so that you know, people could understand how immigration, how you know, the images that people were seeing from the border, uh, issues like DACA, how do they affect us here in central Wisconsin? And so we were very lucky to discover the Bipartisan Policy Center. And, and Teresa, we're very happy to have you come last uh, February to give the first uh, hosts the first event of our three-part series, kind of giving the history of immigration. Uh, the second part was a panel discussion of people from our area that was um, that, that were all affected by the immigration issue in some way, shape, or form. And then the third part was supposed to be uh, community uh, or discussions around what we can do uh, to address immigration issues in our area. That, of course, got changed because of COVID. It all became uh, virtual. But that just really um, held so well with the roundtables that BPC was doing. And we just really wanted to make sure that in your work, the voices of rural um, America would be heard. Thanks so much. So Mark, let me bring you in here. Um, at the top, I sort of told you the very high level sort of what consensus areas we found when we were talking to these folks in Texas and in Wisconsin. But you and the Pew Research Center have been studying attitudes toward immigration and immigrants for a very long time. Um, let me ask you, how did what we hear compare to what your polling says is where America is? Uh, and actually, uh, I, it uh, paired very well with what we've been seeing over the last, frankly, last uh, almost 30 years of polling on asking the U.S. public about their views of immigrants. For example, uh, today, uh, we find that about two thirds of Americans say immigrants strengthen the country. They strengthen the country because of their hard talents and their hard work. Um, but also, when you uh, look at the trend over time, there's been a change in the way the U.S. public sees immigrants in the United States. Back in the 1990s, actually, two thirds of Americans would have said immigrants were a burden rather than a strength. Today, as I noted earlier, two thirds say they're a strength rather than a burden. But in other measures that we have, everything from the impact of, uh, of newcomers to the country on, say, American cultures and traditions uh, or diversity, you see the American public seeing immigrants as having more of a positive effect on the country than a negative effect. Even so, we also do find a mix of views about where immigrants have an impact. So while immigrants generally mm -hmm. are seen as strengthening the country, we also have found over the years that, for example, when it comes to the economy and crime, Immigrants are sometimes seen as perhaps having more of a negative effect than a positive effect on the country. But when it comes to, for example, science and technology, or it comes to diversity of culture, you find that the American public generally sees immigrants more in a positive light. And of course, where immigrants are from can also vary as well. And when you take a look at Texas and Wisconsin, you have many immigrants who are from Latin America. And generally speaking, Latin American immigrants are seen positively, 
but not as positively, say, as immigrants from Asia or from Europe, who are generally seen in the most positive light by the U.S. public. But it is striking that, generally speaking, the U.S. public has become more the view in the last uh, 10 years or so that immigrants are a strength for our country and make the nation better. Thanks. That's really important. Um, Julie, let me follow up with that. Um, so, you know, Wisconsin has a history of sort of immigration from like the 19th century, but then in the early 20th century or middle 20th century, you had a large influx of Hmong refugees into Wisconsin. And then more recently, some of the Latin American uh, immigrants to your area. And one of the things we did here in the roundtables in Wisconsin was that some of those immigrant communities had some challenges fitting in. Um, you know, do you think that how do you think Wisconsin has been dealing with immigrants sort of over time? And do you think that they're getting better at sort of being that open and welcome community? Uh, well, I think it's something we can definitely be better at. Uh, I don't think that Wisconsin has really a reputation for really valuing diversity. Um, Milwaukee is the most segregated city in the country and has been for a while. So we're up against a, a, a lot. Um, you know, there certainly are people, lots of people that value the cultural diversity that is brought by other cultures, but there are still a lot of people who mistrust immigrants or you know, we heard at some of our, uh, one of our events, somebody stood up who was very upset because they said immigrants are taking jobs away from veterans and, um, you know, they're, they're taking public, they're, they're using public benefits. And in, in, in terms of how to address that, that's, that's part of our, our mission is just to get information out there to engage people. We also had people after some of our events who actually said to us, I really learned a lot here. So um, there's a long way to go, but we, have a, we know what we need to do. Yeah. Laura, when we were talking to the folks in and around Houston, we heard a lot about how uh, the participants at least felt that immigrants make Houston a vibrant city, uh, how local leaders see that strength as a strength and actually market that when they're looking for investment to come into the area. Why do you think immigrants make Houston a great city and why do you think Houston welcomes them so much? Well, I guess I would say, how don't immigrants make Houston a great city? <laughs> so immigrants comprise more than 23% of the population. And just based on that fact alone, play a key role in our economy, our workforce, communities, arts and culture, food, and political systems. So our city has long been known for in entrepreneurial, innovative, and problem-solving spirit. And immigrants certainly contribute strongly to that. Um, the city um, has had a significant immigrant immigrant population for you know a long time, and so we're used to it. And I think um, you know having a strong immigrant population keeps the region connected to the world at large. Um, and, you know, we're just sort of known as a place where you can always learn something new from someone who is not the same as you. And we hear, we hear repeatedly that employers tell us that immigrants are certainly a critical part of their workforce. So I think this sort of notion of Houston, worldwide city, is just kind of an estate identity. Thanks so much. So, Mark, um, obviously, Wisconsin and Texas kind of have very different histories with immigration and with immigrants. Um, but your research has shown that where immigrants have gone historically isn't necessarily where immigrants are right now. Tell us more about that, about where immigrants are and why there's maybe some uh, differences in how they are welcomed in different places. So there is a, a dispersion of the nation's uh, immigrant population that's happened since 1965. And in fact, it's very interesting when you take a look at how many immigrants have actually arrived in the United States uh, over the course of the past 50 plus years. You'll find that almost 60 million people have come to the United States over this period. And well, destinations like Florida or New York or California or Texas, which are traditionally the immigrant destination places, at least in the latter part of the 20th century, um, do have the largest immigrant populations today, you do find that places like Alabama, for example, or Georgia, 
or North Carolina or the Dakotas have seen the arrival of immigrants in recent decades, in recent years, in fact, um, that uh, now uh, result in an interesting finding in our public opinion surveys, which is when we ask the American public, are there immigrants in your community? 80% of U.S. adults say, yes, there are. So if you think about that, that means that the immigrant populations of the country are really quite dispersed. And that's exactly what you see in Census Bureau data. There are immigrants in Alaska, in Montana, as well as South Florida and Los Angeles. Now, that's interesting because the story of immigration is one that's not just, again, about the destination places, the traditional destination places of New York and Los Angeles, for example, but actually one about new arrivals coming to places that haven't traditionally had immigrants. So another way to look at this is, is if you look at it in a place like Alabama, about a quarter of immigrants who live in Alabama have arrived in the last uh, five years or so. When you look at a place mm -hmm. like Texas, you'll find that about a quarter have been in the U.S. for 20 years or more. So if you think about that, that's a very different distribution of time in the U.S., which tells you something about where people are arriving and how long they've stayed in a place. So I imagine that a lot of the immigrants are going to these places because of work, right, for, for, for jobs. Julie, one of the things we heard a lot in Wisconsin was how important immigrants were to the economy. Uh, we know how important the dairy industry is in Wisconsin, um, but we also heard about immigrants participating in the healthcare sector, particularly providing rural healthcare where there's a shortage of providers. Um, tell us more about how immigrants are fitting into the Wisconsin economy. Well, we are proud cheeseheads here in this state, no matter where you're located. And but what I think is very, very little known by even the, the citizens in this state is the absolutely vital role that immigrants, especially from Latin America, play in the dairy industry. Um, it is estimated that on large dairy farms, so we're talking uh, over 800 cows, which make up about three fourths of all farms in Wisconsin now, the vast majority of uh, employees on those farms are immigrants. And farmers that we talk to will tell you that if there, you know, if, if there was some sort of you know, policy where these people needed to get sent back to where they come from, our dairy industry would absolutely collapse. And that is just not very known, but it, that's why it's so important that you know, policies get put in place so that we can do right by these people who are sustaining our, our most essential um, sector of the economy. Uh, and, and then it's true too, what you said about uh, rural healthcare. There are so many, right here, where I am right now is a community about, of about 85,000 surrounded by many counties of lots of farms, very rural areas. And there are so many initiatives by uh, medical schools or the government to attract people, to attract healthcare workers to come to, to serve these communities. And some of those are immigrants. Um, you know, in our discussions, we talked especially with someone who was a doctor from India. Uh, but you know, she is under threat of or was under threat of having to leave. And it makes no sense that that she would have that concern when we so desperately need the the expertise that she can provide. Yeah. Um, Laura, the, the Houston area has a very diverse economy, a high tech, healthcare, education, other business. But we also heard in Houston about the need for workers in construction and landscaping and other uh, sort of maybe lesser skilled or lower wage or jobs. Um, can you tell us more about how immigrants fit into that Texas economy? Um, I am going to focus, if it's OK, with how uh, immigrants fit into the Houston economy. Sure. Sorry, and Houston. And then I'm going to throw, this will be the greater Houston economy, and I'm going to throw some stats out. So sure. um, as I mentioned before, immigrants represent 23% of the population and hold 29% of jobs. Immigrants make up 34% um, of STEM jobs, 40, represent 43% of scientists, 42% of doctors and 48% workforce, 32% of fatality workforce. Um, and a statistic we focused on recently during the pandemic, 27% of the overall healthcare workforce. You can see um, significant 
um, portions of jobs um, across industries and across skill levels are held by immigrants in Houston. So um, in a report that we put out, we also ran some economic kind of scenarios, kind of an exercise to sort of get at how important immigrants are to GDP in our region. So we ran one scenario that cutting immigration by through 2036, and we found that would significantly depress economic growth, even a, a loss of $51 billion of potential P growth. On the flip side, in the scenario of increasing immigration, 30% would actually have the potential to add $67.2 billion in GDP growth. So, you know, we issue how critical immigrants are to our economic growth, but also these statistics and numbers show you that we absolutely need immigrants to meet our workforce demands. So, Mark, um, you've done a lot of work, uh, not only where immigrants live, but where they work and how they work. Um, and immigrants are represented in many fields and occupations. How do Americans see these contributions? And um, you've heard some of the statistics from, you know, both Julie and Laura. Um, you know, there are places where immigrants may be heavily represented and then not so much. But why is that important? So uh, yes, on the national level, to to mirror the findings from Houston, the Houston area, immigrants are overrepresented in the U.S. labor force compared to their share of the population. And you find that they're more likely to be, for example, engaged in the labor force. Their labor force participation rate is higher and has been for uh, uh, several decades now than the general U.S. public. Um, now, that's perhaps not surprising because many immigrants do come here for economic opportunity, not necessarily for education, not for necessarily other reasons, but they come as adults looking for economic opportunity. So what we've seen is we've seen that the U.S. public does value the role of immigrants in the United States. But again, there is a mix of opinions here. On the one hand, for example, the U.S. public, uh, for example, wants uh, the US, uh, U.S. immigration policy to allow for those who are in the country uh, and who are undocumented to have a way to stay here legally. That's partly because they see the value of immigrants in their communities and see immigrants as contributing to the labor force, the local economy, and so much more. Um, so when you talk to the public, you do see the public is generally of the view that immigrants in general have a positive impact on the U.S. economically, culturally, and in some other ways as well. Though again, not every uh, American adult feels the same way about immigrants. And there are some quite nuanced viewpoints about the role of immigrants in perhaps um, being a burden on the country because they take jobs, uh, housing, and health care from others, which echoes some of the challenges of integration that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Yeah, yeah, we, we did hear a little bit of that. I was amazed, though, at how overall, I think, positive our roundtables were uh, in, in Houston and in, and in Wisconsin. Um, Julie, coming back to you, we, we did hear folks in Wisconsin talk about feeling like what they hear in the news or social media about immigration doesn't necessarily reflect where they feel they are on the immigration issues. Um, they, they felt like people were either talking about immigrants are all criminals or take our jobs or, you know, we have to let everybody in and just have open borders. Um, in your dialogues in Wisconsin on immigration, both what we did in the roundtables and afterwards, how do the how do the folks feel about the the way that the discussion around immigration is happening in this country? Well, you know, it's interesting to get to your point about you know how how immigrants are are treated. It, it's those those discussions were really important to everyone because those who are in the majority culture think, oh, you know, we, immigrants are fantastic. They're, you know, great contributors to our culture, to our society. And there, there's no, pro there are no problems with, you know, prejudice or discrimination. And then when you talk to the people who are themselves immigrants or who are even like you, we, you mentioned the Hmong earlier, uh, Teresa. So in, many of those people here were born here. Their parents immigrated from uh, Thailand. And, and they still are experiencing a lot of um, horrible discriminatory behavior. So the it, it was good to have that those dialogues so that those of us who are in the majority culture can see, okay, yeah, this this is still a problem here. Um, you know, the interesting thing about the the immigrant groups 
that we have around here in central Wisconsin, the Hmong and, and Latin American is they are very quiet. So, you know, the, the stereotype mm -hmm. that they are causing trouble, that they are, um, you know, criminals, it just, just doesn't hold water. They really try to keep a low profile. They don't want to call attention to themselves. And in fact, we one of our discussions included the county sheriff for um, the county that we are in. And he expressed frustration with that, not because you know he's looking to, to, um, to, to find criminals, but because people who are immigrants, when they are the victims of crime, are so reluctant to report it. And that really makes his job and, and the whole um, law enforcement job really, really difficult to do. Yeah. Um, Laura, what, what about in Houston? Uh, this was a pretty hard fought election year. We, we talked to your, 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 your neighbors in Houston uh, in around the middle of last year. Um, you know, did, did they, have you seen the conversation around immigration becoming more or less productive in your point of view? Um, over the last year? Um, I guess I would say in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. Um, mm -hmm. Among many segments of the business, there's and then a realization that immigrants and immigration are critically important. However, anti-immigrant rhetoric certainly resonated among some of our voters. Um, and you know you certainly heard it from some of our politicians not all of our politicians um mm -hmm. you know hopefully this nation can move past that we're going into a legislative session in texas and you know there remains dismay um by some at the disconnect between the attitudes of the houston region and the houston region business community versus policies that have been passed by state lawmakers, for example, are show me your state papers legislation. And so, you know, in the focus groups we conducted with you, we clearly saw again, participants valuing immigrants in our region and understanding the important immigration is to our economic future. Um, you know, they view anti-immigrant messages is bad and disruptive for our economy, for our immigrant, for immigrants themselves, and for the ability to create rational state and national policies. Um, I guess it just remains to be seen where we all go from, from here. Yeah. So Mark, I know that you've studied these national divides around immigration and the national opinion, and you talked earlier about what some of the, the top lines are, but let's break that down a little bit because there are still places and people who, uh, you know, have, have strongly, strongly held opinions on, on the other side of this issue uh, that see immigrants, as you said, as taking away jobs or taking benefits and those kinds of things and have negative opinions. Where are the divides most starkly noted? Is it, is it on basis of party, uh, geography, race, what, where, where do you see those divides? So the divide is widest when it comes to uh, political parties. So you'll find that, for example, Democrats are of the view that uh, immigrants drink in the country more so than, say, Republicans, although notably a growing share of Republicans over the last 10 years or so also say immigrants drink in the country. But when it comes to specific policy issues like uh, for example, building the border wall, which was an important issue during the Trump administration, you find, for example, that a growing share of Republicans over the course of the Trump administration years said that it was important to uh, build the border wall for greater border security. But the share of Democrats has said so it didn't change much and it was a very, very low share. In fact, fewer than 10% uh, said that that should be an issue or something that should be focused on as a key priority for immigration policy. But even more broadly, when you just ask uh, the U.S. public about should immigration, addressing immigration uh, as a policy issue be an important priority for the president and the Congress, right before COVID-19 happened, we had seen immigration rising as an issue in the public's mind, particularly for Republicans as something that should be addressed uh, by the administration and by Congress. Partly, I think this was reflecting everything that happened in 2019 with regards to asylum seekers from Central America arriving at the U.S. southern border and seeking asylum in the United States. There was a lot of press attention to this, and there was a lot of rhetoric around this as well. But it's also important to note that 
not everybody in groups that are even largely foreign born or have a large foreign born population feel the same way about immigration policy or immigrants themselves. So for example, we have found over the years that about 15% of US Latino adults think that immigrants who are in the country without authorization or who are undocumented or in the country illegally should be deported. Now, um, uh, when you take a look at the US Latino population uh, and particularly US immigrants from Latin America, that is also the largest source of unauthorized or undocumented immigrants in the country. And another look at this, if you take a, if you ask a, about particularly the asylum seekers arriving from Central America at the US-Mexico border over the course of 2019, we found that in December of 2019, that about half of Latino adults said that the US doesn't have a responsibility to accept asylum seekers from Central America. So again, not every group, even groups that are largely or have a large foreign born component, feel the same way about immigrants. And I think this points to this divide that sometimes it's partisan. Sometimes it's about, I got here first, I did it legally, but others aren't. Sometimes it's about um, just a, a, a low uh, sense of immigration being an important uh, element of the US economy or for the US generally speaking. But it is striking that not everybody, no matter the group, feels the same way about immigrants. And there are some stark divides. Yeah, yeah. Um, so finally, in the time we have left, we did ask our groups uh, what solutions they wanted to see for immigration in the United States. Um, and what we heard, I would say, most people would say sounds like common sense solutions. Uh, it, in fact, it sounded very much to me like the participants sort of wanted a all of the above solution, uh, which is, yes, they wanted uh, a legal way for people to come in and work, they wanted also to have border security. Um, they wanted to keep families together uh, and they wanted humanitarian protections, um, but they didn't want to see people continue to break the law, right? There's sort of the, the, the can, can't we have it all? Why do we have to have one or the other? Why do we have to prioritize w one or the other? Laura, you know, when, when you talk with other Houstonians and the, and the things that you've done with Center of Houston's future, um, is that, do you hear more of that? Is that kind of what they, what you're hearing people talk about? If people could have an ideal solution and something, you know, just absolutely many people would like that. Uh, I think those involved in, in the business community stress that they would like practical, flexible solutions that meet their needs that may change from year to year. Um, I think you would also find different businesses and industries have their own top priorities. So great if they could get sort of the ideal solution, but if they can't, then they want what's important to their business, whether it be number of visas or being able to, you know, permanently retain someone they have spent time training or sponsoring. I would also say that there is kind of broad support around DACA and Dreamers as a logical and you know easy first step if we have to do it in steps. And I think what we are seeing, again, among people who are um, supportive of immigration, broad agreement around a solution that um, gives status to undocumented workers, although I don't know the on what that would entail and how far it would go, but um, and then I also think, you know, that those involved in kind of community roles or the advocacy groups around, you know, want to make sure that whatever the first solution is deals with kind of social and humanitarian needs. That's not to say the business leaders don't get that too. And then I guess a final point I would make would be that um, COVID has certainly brought home, I think, to a lot of people who maybe hadn't thought about it, how important immigrants are in the healthcare workforce and you know, also the need and the importance of providing healthcare and access to all segments of the population, including those without status. Yeah, Julie, um, you know, I think when I when I listened to the folks in Wisconsin talk about solutions, it very much reflected sort of what I consider Midwestern pragmatism. Uh, that sort of uh, can't we just get figure out how to get it done? Um, you know, what else have you heard from your conversations? What do you think people want to see the the new government, the new Congress, and and the new administration try to do around immigration? Well, definitely a clear path to citizenship. 
uh, I referred earlier to the agriculture industry and healthcare, and you know those are just two industries where you know it's a supply and demand thing. Like they they need workers, and immigrants are available and willing to do the work. In fact, that's something I didn't mention earlier about with the work that has done on dairy farms. It is very hard physical work, and, and um, farmers cannot find American born um, workers who are willing to do that kind of work. Um, so, you know, they're, they're here, they're supporting our economy. Let's find a way to get them uh, status. Um, and yes. <laughs> so Mark, you, you talked a little bit about some of the policies that you, you've pulled on. I mean, we just saw uh, the Biden administration is introducing a very large immigration bill in Congress um, that has the, probably the broadest legalization measures that I have ever seen in any uh, bill that's been introduced. Um, it also uh, contains some, some reforms to our legal immigration system. It sounds like it's going to allot some more visas to uh, employment-based immigrants. But, you know, in terms of the policies, we've also heard sort of immediately from the, but what about the border crowd? Because uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot about the border in this bill. Um, you know, the, in your polling, um, is there is there these priorities that you heard sort of the business community has one set of priorities and maybe other people have other set of priorities? What what do you think is sort of the the sweet spot from your polling here? So as you noted earlier, the public has many different priorities when it comes to immigration. And in fact, it's oftentimes supportive of uh, a majority will say we should have more border security, but at the same time that the U.S. should be accepting of asylum seekers, generally speaking. And that's exactly what we see in our polling, that there's a wide variety of priorities that the public emphasizes, though, again, sometimes tied to partisanship. Border security is actually one of the priorities that both Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. public, generally speaking, support the Republicans more so than Democrats. But as uh, as some of the uh, focus groups showed, there's a lot of support as well for providing a, a, a pathway to citizenship or at least a way for people in the country who are undocumented to be able to stay if they, uh, if they uh, pay a few fines and haven't committed any crimes. Usually there's some caveats to that. But we find that three quarters of Americans, including a majority of Republicans, support that kind of policy, which is something that the Biden proposals that we just uh, saw yesterday um, are exactly the kinds of things that there seems to be good support among the U.S. public for. And that includes DREAMers or the DACA program. We find that about three quarters, almost 80 percent of the U.S. public support something like DACA, uh, allowing those who came to the country as children illegally to stay and perhaps even become U.S. citizens. And that's a strong finding that we've had for many years and that cuts across partisanship lines in different parts of the U.S. public. So it is uh, interesting that there are different priorities. There are different um, uh, emphases depending on which political party we're talking about, for example. But broadly speaking, there is interest in some immigration policy reform, whether that be about border security or uh, uh, allowing those who are in the country illegally to stay in some way if they meet certain requirements. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to thank you all for, for participating in this. I think to wrap it up, what I would say is that we are, uh, we hope that our leaders in Washington, in Congress, and in the administration will listen to the views of the constituents across the country, uh, the, the views of Texas and Wisconsin being, you know, more representative than not, it sounds like, uh, of, than the rest of the country. Uh, I wanna thank uh, both you, Julie, and you, Laura, and the Center for Houston's Future and the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service for helping us with these roundtables, for, for putting them together, allowing us to talk to your, uh, your, your neighbors in your community about this issue. Mark, thank you so much for providing the context. Um, we will be releasing, as I mentioned, this report at the same time this podcast goes live early uh, on the week of the 25th. So you can find that on our website, which is uh, bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. And uh, we, this is that concludes uh, this week in immigration. We hope to see you next time. Thank you, everybody.